Hi guys. Welcome to Five Factors of Health presented by me, Alicia McCarty. Uh, let me share my screen here, show you this presentation. Okay. Um, okay. This, uh, Happy New Year everybody, by the way. And I was originally supposed to do this presentation in, uh, over the summer, but then obviously the schedule got all changed because of coronavirus. And this might be actually a more appropriate time to do the five factors of health because perhaps it's more top of mind this time of year with um, new beginnings and resolutions and whatnot. So hopefully you can find something interesting in here. I am going over the five factors of health. Those are some, uh, a framework of thinking about health that I've adapted from Ben Bergeron. Um, he is a well-known CrossFit coach. I'll get into him a little bit more. Um, like I said, my name is Alicia Ucardi. I, um, oh, here, here we go, about me. Um, I am a Hillsborough resident. I've been here for about 13 years. Um, here's my family, my husband, I have three kids. Um, they are 12, 10, and seven. I've been a personal trainer for 15 years and I am the owner of Fitborough Nutrition and fitness coaching here in Hillsboro. This is the studio um, and a little bit about me. I love CrossFit, um, which you'll probably hear a little bit more about in this presentation. I love self-improvement. I currently am reigniting my interest for reading books. That has certainly um, increased a lot now with the coronavirus. Um, I love music, listening to it and making it. Um, and our family is currently in the process of trying to pick up the, the um, sport of skiing. So that is fun for us, trying to keep us busy here this winter. Keep us busy, keep us sane. And I am eagerly awaiting the day my kids can go back to school. Um, so first let's talk about what is health. Um, I think that probably a lot of people might view health as um, or maybe Western medicine would view health as the absence of disease. And um, CrossFit has a different definition of what health is and one that I prefer much more. Um, it's not the absence of disease, right? We would consider that a, um, um, like the cost of entry. Like, yeah, you don't have disease, but can, do you also have the ability to do work over broad time, hold on a second, over broad time, modality, and age domains. What does that mean? That means, can you do work, um, whether it's quick bursts of intense work, um, such as sprinting to chase your dog as she runs into the street? Can you do work that takes a long time, such as mulching your entire yard? Um, modality, meaning different ways of using your body. Can you use your body in all different ways? Can you crouch down? Can you get on the ground? Can you reach up over to that overhead bin with your luggage? Remember when that was a thing? Um, um, and age domains, meaning can you do that over the span of your life? Um, when you're 90, can you use the stairs still? Can you um, you know, take care of yourself. And if you kind of go from that headspace of where do I wanna be when I'm 90 or 110 or wherever you plan on living to, what do you need to do today to get there, right? You wanna be able to do this work over your lifetime. And by work, it's, it's not work. It's just, can you physically do things with your body, okay? Um, what are the five factors? Here, I'm going to give it all to you up front. The five factors of health, as I said, this is adapted by Ben Bergeron. I think I forgot to speak um, a little bit about him. He is a well-known CrossFit coach. He owns a CrossFit gym up in New England. He has um, coached several athletes who have gone to the highest level of the CrossFit Games and been on the podium. He has written books. He has a great podcast, all of which I highly recommend. Um, I'm a big fan of his. And like I said, these principles are adapted from him. So the five factors are eating, sleeping,
training, which I think are probably obvious ones for most people in, interested in the health space. Um, the final two are thinking and connection. Okay, and I'll dive a little bit deeper into each one of those factors. So eating, how should you eat? Um, it, most of these concepts, and I'll probably keep repeating this, are very um, simple to understand. And uh, they're very simple to understand, maybe not easy to implement, right? So Michael Pollan has this great book called Food Rules. Um, and it breaks it down and here's the rules. Eat real food, not too much and mostly plants, right? Um, eat real food. So that means eat unprocessed food, eat things that grew out of the ground or had a mother. Um, not too much, obviously, if you're constantly pushing away from the table saying how stuffed you are, that probably has crossed the line to an unhealthy behavior um, and mostly plants. So when you do sit down to eat, have a, about half of your plate being the fresh fruits or vegetables. Um, like I said, simple, but of course not always easy, especially in our society where it's all too easy to eat highly processed um, food. When food is highly processed, it's all the easier to overeat it because the normal like, um, cues that your body gives you for fullness are not reached. Um, and it's, it's just all too easy to do the wrong thing in this day and age. So you really have to be very mindful about making choices that would lead you in the direction of the nutrition goals that you're aiming for, okay? Um, I could talk about this one all day. This is what I do all day, most of the day. So it's really hard for me to leave this slide, but I will. Um, sleep. Um, how should you sleep? How can you make sleep a uh, factor of health? Um, you should aim to get seven to nine hours of sleep per night. And again, I feel that our society many times prizes how little sleep we can get by on. And that is not necessarily something to brag about. Um, this is a great book that I recently read called Why We Sleep. It's by Matthew Walker. Um, highly recommend if you wanna dive a little bit deeper into sleep. Um, Cause it really is a strange concept as this book talks about, you know, that, that we basically are unconscious for, you know, a third of our, a third of our lives and why did, why are we made that way? But it is very important. Um, and as much as we don't know about sleep, there's a lot that we do know about sleep. Um, lack of sleep is linked to weight gain, depression, rep repressed immunity, and Alzheimer's. Um, and by lack of sleep, that is clinically defined as six and a half hours or less. Um, so this is a big one that I am currently working on. It's none of this stuff is very exciting. There's nothing I'm gonna post on Instagram or Facebook to brag about how much sleep I got, but it will probably change my life in more ways than I can imagine, just getting an extra half hour of sleep because I was chronically about six and a half or less. Um, working on it, work in progress like us all, right? Um, so there was a study, I forget if I read it in this book or not, um, but it, it took, healthy college age, I, I think it was only men, um, but they took healthy college age men and maybe it was, maybe it was men and women, but they sleep deprived them for seven days. So, and by sleep deprived, they gave them six and a half hours of sleep, which most people wouldn't even consider that sleep deprived, which is crazy to me. And when they tested their blood after the sleep deprivation of seven days, they tested pre-diabetic. So this lack of sleep caused the hormones in their body to change in a very measurable way. Okay, they, they couldn't no longer process glucose appropriately. Isn't that crazy? Um, and then they let them sleep appropriately as they wished. So um, about eight hours a night. And after they let them sleep appropriately, they tested their blood again, no longer pre-diabetic. I thought that was fascinating. Um, yeah. Okay. Sleep. Training. 
Oh, here's another one I could talk about all day. How should we train? Um, I once again will look at here. Right? I will. I will look at the. Um, wow, that's distracting. While that's going, isn't it? <laughs> here's me training <laughs> the other day. So. I will once again look to CrossFit for their definition of training. We should train five to six times per week of constantly varied movements performed at a relatively high intensity. And we should get movement throughout the day. So what does all that mean? I think some people might have a, um, a um, idea of CrossFit in their head where it's um, a little bit more extreme than it necessarily has to be. If you break down this definition, this can be applied to every single person on the earth, okay? Constantly varied means probably not the best idea to go and do the exact same thing every day. If you are always um, running, there's likely going to be stress injuries. If you're always biking, there's likely to be stress injuries. Um, so constant, if you're always going and grabbing the exact same dumbbells and doing three sets of 10 bicep curls, it's likely not the most beneficial thing for your body. Constantly very, always doing something different. Okay. Um, relatively high intensity. I think this is where people get a little confused. Relatively high intensity means that something will be a high intensity to every single person, but that thing is a different thing, okay? Um, if I train a 20 year old college athlete, their high intensity is different from my high intensity, is different from my grandma's high intensity. We can all do the same workout, quote unquote, the same workout, but it would likely look very different. So in that video, I was doing 61 burpees for one of my clients for her birthday present. You're welcome. <laughs> for the 20 year old college athlete, those burpees might have been 60 burpees and then coupled with another maybe barbell movement. For my grandma, the burpee, the, the, it likely wouldn't have been a burpee. It might have been not a burpee all the way to the ground, right? It might have been to a, an elevated surface, but how much more functional can you get than being able to get on the ground and get all the way up? That's, that's the piece I forgot, functional movements. I got constantly varied. Functional movements means, can you use your body to do something useful in your life, right? Like um, the burpee is getting on the ground and getting back up. I would argue that's a very functional, useful thing to be able to do. It's also very useful to be able to get down on your back and get back up. Um, it's also very useful to be able to pick heavy things up off the ground. It's also very useful to be able to put heavy things up over your head. That's why we train the way we do. And then secondly, I added that not only five to six times per week of constantly varied functional movements at a relatively high intensity, not only that, but are you getting movement throughout your day? So is it enough? that we just do 61 burpees and call it a day and then sit on the couch. No, we need to be up and moving low level of movement throughout the day. That's why um, I love the, um, uh, the step counter on like Apple watches and things like that. Those recommendations of 10,000 steps a day are great goals to shoot for. Um, if you just want to see if you are getting adequate movement throughout the day. Moving on how you think. So now I'm getting outside of my comfort zone, right? I might talk to people about nutrition and training all the time, but how often do we talk to people about their mindset? Um, mindset matters. Here's another really good book um, called Mindset by Carol Dweck. It's the idea of this book mindset is that we can we can change, essentially, that we can change. We're not born one way or the other. Um, if you, having a mindset of growth, so not saying to yourself, oh, I'm bad at math, saying to yourself, oh, I'm learning how to do this better, and I can get better at this. Um, I think this is super relevant to this entire aspect of health, because if somebody has the mindset of, I am not a healthy person, 
they will be right. Maybe one of the most important things to start with is I am working on becoming a healthier person, right? Just shifting your mindset will take you very, very far. Um, so focus on what we can control. That's a hard one. We love to focus on all the things outside our control because it's easy to worry about them because we have no control over them. Um, practice the art of only focusing on what you can control. Coach Ben Bergeron talks a lot about this. Never whine, never complain, never make excuses. And that one's a hard one for me to swallow. I'm not sure if I'm completely on board with that one, but I think his main point in those three things, never whine, never complain, never make excuses, is generally when we're whining or complaining, it's from a bad mindset. You are in the mindset that you are stuck. Um, and perhaps you are talking about something that you have no control over. Anyway, in which case, maybe you need to just let it go. <clears throat> um, growth mindset, that's what I was speaking about. This book is all about having a growth mindset, if you want to dive deeper into that. Um, and then I think Einstein had a quote when he was just saying, if you ask yourself, do you live in a friendly or hostile world? Likely, that is how you, you know, that's how you view everything, and that's how you will view health, that's how you will view people. And it can determine your outcomes of a lot of things, just depending on what type of world you think you live in. <coughs> um, excuse me. Um, Coach Bergeron has a really great TED talk. Um, and it's, it's called Your Mind is a Weapon, where he talks about um, weaponizing your mind and having strength, a, a very strong mind. Hold on. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh my gosh, talking this much, it's dry throat. Connection. Um, I think we can all agree. And is this stuff, I don't know if this is recording all that stuff, but how should you connect? Um, feels like that's really not appropriate for me to say how you need to connect, but it is shown that connection is a deep factor of health. People with deeper emotional connections live longer and they have studies from the blue zones saying that people with these deeper connections tend to live longer. So the idea is to build, sustain, grow meaningful relationships. Um, so how, I think it's interesting to think of all these five factors. And, and one thing I didn't mention before was, um, if you remember the five factors are eat, sleep, train, think, and connect. Um, and um, Coach Bergeron put them in that order for a reason. He felt like that it was, that was sort of a order of priority. <clears throat> that if you needed to, if one of them moved the dial more so than others, it would probably be in that order. Eating, sleeping, training, thinking, and connecting. Okay, which I just thought was an important thing to note. Um, secondly, after I spoke about all those things, um, what is your mindset, right? How do you feel after hearing that perhaps those are some great areas to focus on? Do you feel like you have room for improvement um, in any of those areas? I would argue that we all probably do. Um, and that's great um, because right now is a great time to get a little teeny tiny bit better. This, the second half of the presentation talks about how we can improve ourselves. Um, primarily focusing on what I do with my coaching, which is habit change. A lot of what I'm going to be, all of what I'm going to be talking about next comes from the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. And this um, graph is from that book also. Okay, it's called The Power of Tiny Gains, this graph. And you can see if you got 1% better every single day for an entire year, your trajectory would be up and to the right. Okay. And if you got 1% worse every single day, where your trajectory would also be. Um, I think 
many times people view this time of year for to make sweeping drastic changes. And generally those are short-lived and very exciting, but they're short-lived and not, sustain not sustainable. So ultimately not helpful. What can you do that's very tiny, that is sustainable and repeatable because you are what you repeat. Um, like I said, uh, I'm talking about this book, Atomic Habits Now by James Clear. What are habits? So when we want, when we finally hone in on something we want to change, we want to focus on a very small element of that change. Um, so habits are routines we regularly perform and they make us who we are. You are what you repeat. Don't underestimate the power of tiny, seemingly unnoticeable changes. They compound and um, the author says that time magnifies the margin between success and failure. I love that. Um, and I have an example from the book here. Um, the impact created by a change in your habits is similar to the effect of shifting the route of an airplane by just a few degrees. Imagine you're flying from LA to New York. If a pilot leaving from LAX adjusts the heading just 3.5 degrees south, you're gonna land in Washington, DC instead of New York. Such a small change is barely noticeable at takeoff. The nose of the airplane moves just a few feet, but when magnified across the entire United States, you end up hundreds of miles apart. Similarly, a slight change in daily habits can guide your life to a very different destination. Making a choice that is 1% better or 1% worse seems insignificant in the moment. But over the span of moments that make up a lifetime, these choices determine the difference between who you are and who you could be. Success is the product of daily habits, not once in a lifetime transformations. That's kind of the basis of this entire book. And then it goes into, so he's selling the idea of, can small changes really make a difference? The idea is that they magnify over time. And they, yes, they can make a big difference and they're, easier to make. Um, so let's see. So he has four laws of behavior change. Um, and I will go over those four laws. The first law is to make the change obvious. Um, so he says to pair a desired behavior with a current behavior so, so that you won't forget it. Okay, so like um, it, it, the formula is after current habit. I will, new habit. So if you want to start taking a multivitamin, after I pour my cup of coffee, I will take my multivitamin. Something that you always do is something that you want to do so that you don't forget it. Um, simple, right? Um, or instead of pairing it with a current behavior, just be super specific about it. So at, um, I will behavior at time in location. So. I will take my vitamin at 7 a.m. in the kitchen. So just having a very specific, not I'm gonna start taking a vitamin, guaranteed you will forget tomorrow. It has to be very, very specific. Um, for me, because I am working a lot on improving my sleep. Um, and one thing I noticed that was hindering my sleep was just the fact that I was scrolling on my phone for an extra 45 minutes when I laid down. So. I just needed to not bring my phone to bed. So after I brush my teeth, I will leave my phone in the bathroom. And guess what? I started getting 40 minutes more of sleep every single night. Um, maybe something for your mindset. Maybe you want to work on meditation. You could say, after I pour my cup of coffee, I will meditate for one minute. And don't laugh at how simple that sounds. Um, it starts to snowball and make a difference. It makes a change. Um, to break a new habit, he has these laws about creating new, creating new habits, but to break a bad habit, you can always just inverse the law. So uh, make it obvious would become make it invisible, which is kind of like what I did with my phone. I made my phone invisible and it wasn't even an issue. I didn't want to look. I didn't want to look at it. The fact that it wasn't there, it was invisible. I didn't need to. This is a great one for nutrition. Um, um, you know, a lot of times when I first start coaching people in nutrition, it's get rid of all the stuff that's tempting. 
And I know that sounds stupid and obvious and you're like, well, I know that, but actually do it. If, if it is not in your house, when you have a craving at nine o'clock at night and it's dark, I guarantee you're not getting in your car to go get the junk food that you're gonna overeat. Make it invisible, get it out. Now is a great time to get it out. There's probably still some holiday leftovers there that probably aren't gonna do you any good. You can get rid of them. They serve their purpose. They had their time. They were delicious. You don't still need them. Um, it, I like this quote, this is also from the book. People with high self control tend to spend less time in tempting situations. It's easier to avoid temptation than resist it. Um, people with high self-control tend to spend less time in tempting situations. So do they have high self-control? Maybe not, maybe they're just not tempted. They don't have to flex that self-control muscle. Um, self-control is a short-term strategy, that's another point. Like, if you think that you're gonna muscle through and self-control something, you're probably gonna be exhausted by the end of the day and by the end of five weeks of doing something. So try to get it out of the environment as much as possible. Make it obvious or make it invisible if you're trying to get rid of something. Okay, law number two, make it attractive. Um, habits are dopamine driven. Um, every highly habit forming behavior is associated with a spike in dopamine. Um, so me scrolling on social media apparently spiked my dopamine and I would sit there and just do it. I'd automatically reach for my phone and do it. I didn't even know what happened to me. My plan was always to read, but until I made it invisible, I was, scrolling. Once action become, however, once an action becomes a habit, generally the dopamine spike happens when you anticipate um, doing the habit, right? So if you tend to have ice cream every night before bed, there's like a, there's like an excitement around planning the ice cream, where you're going to sit, what's the flavor, where's your spoon? Like that's, that's, most of the exciting thing is the planning. And then you're actually having the ice cream. It's, it doesn't create the, as big of a dopamine spike as it used to. There's graphs of all that in the book. It's really interesting actually. Um, but he says you can do something called temptation bundling. So you would um, take a habit that you want to add. So say I wanna exercise more and I love scrolling through social media. So I'm about to grab my phone and do my social media scroll, but I, but I have a new rule in my head, new law, and I say, well, every time I want a social media scroll, I have to do five burpees and then I can scroll. So what starts to happen is you're planning the scroll. So you're getting the dopamine spike, but you're doing your five burpees. So you can start to associate that dopamine spike with the burpees instead of the social media scroll. And it's not that you're trying to get rid of the social media, it's that you're trying to use that dopamine spike to your advantage when you're doing those burpees. Um, another one of my clients is trying to increase her water intake and she drinks a lot of coffee, especially now when she's home all the time, it's easy to reach for and grab and pour. And, and so I said, well, how about this? And she was talking about how much she loved that coffee. I said, well, why don't you just get a little, maybe like eight ounces, just a small thing that you can drink really quickly and you have to drink a really quick glass of water before every time you have a coffee. And it was so simple that it was almost silly, but she's increased her water by so much and it almost seems effortless to her now because it's like, well, yeah, I'm just gonna get this out of the way and then have my coffee. Um, so that's a great way to make it attractive. Um, let's see. Oh, another way to make it attractive is to join a culture where your desired behavior is the normal behavior. So this is just about being around people who maybe are more like-minded or how you would like your mind to be. So there's another reason why I love CrossFit because it does combine that um, aspect obviously of exercise and movement, but it also um, brings in the connection because there's people there it's the same people usually on a day-to-day -day basis. You form these deep connections. You get to see them on a regular basis. Um, it's, it's a way to make it much more attractive. And that culture has the desired behavior of wanting to become better. Um, to make, to break a bad habit, you would make it unattractive. Okay. So 
there were some examples in the book about how people have reframed their thinking around cigarette smoking on how they used to have the idea in their head that it, it just calmed them down and it was so relaxing to be able to smoke a cigarette. And if there was a lot of reframing going on in their mind where they really, really accepted and believed the idea that it did not calm them down, that it actually made them worse, that it actually was bad for their nerves. And when they fully embraced that idea, that it was much easier for them to quit smoking. Law number three, make it easy. Um, to build a habit, you need to practice it. And I love that word practice, right? So it's not about getting things perfect and right. It's about just try, just see, can you get a little bit better than you were? And stop planning it, start practicing it, right? Make it easy enough where you can do it today. Reduce that friction that, um, that might be there. So one of, one of the places of friction is likely time for many people. So how can we make it easier? We can break it down so that it's very short. If you wanna start a habit of meditation, um, tell yourself that you, after you pour your cup of coffee, will meditate for one minute, right? I think we had that example earlier. Um, if you wanna start a habit of reading more, tell yourself that you'll read one page a day before you go to sleep. Um, once you are on this roll, they, they snowball, right? So once, if you are, in fact, if you've gone two and three weeks with every single night, you read your one page, there's probably going to reach a tipping point where you're like, I want to know what happens on the next page. And you will eventually start reading more, or it can be a very mindful thing, you know, where you can give yourself another rule. Well, now I'm going to read two pages a night. Um, when, when starting a new habit, make sure it can be done in two minutes. Sometimes people are really good with making a exercise habit simply. And the habit is only in the book, he gives an example of somebody who, when they came home from work, they put on their running shoes. That was it. That was like a week. And then the next week they put on their running shoes, walked out the front door to the mailbox and came back. And then the next week it was put on their running shoes went to down the street back and they just kept increasing it little by little. And it seemed much more easy to swallow to create this new habit of going outside for a daily run. Um, to break a bad habit, you would inverse it. You would make it hard. So um, an example might be if um, it, sometimes I have my clients do this when they're trying to clean out their pantries and there's a lot of discord maybe between family members and it's not fair because I like that food. Why are you getting rid of it? Just because you can't handle it. Like, so what if it was just put in a different spot? Sometimes people have shelves in the basement. Maybe instead of those highly tempting foods being in the pantry, just put them on the shelf in the basement. They're still in the house, but you have to go through the mental effort of saying to yourself, do I really want to walk down the flight of stairs again? Is it that important? It might be just enough of a hurdle. Will you be like, nah. um, I use this. Um, I recently stopped biting my nails after 40 years. Um, and I did this stupid thing where I had a little note card. And every time I found myself with my hand in my mouth, I forced myself to stand up and make like, just like a tick mark on a note card. So, I mean, you have, and, and just the idea that I would, I think it just, puts a pause and makes me like realize I really want this in my mouth. Like it, it just breaks that automatic chain of habits. And I, I stopped biting my nails from this card. I just did this card for like a week. So law number four, James Clear says, is to make it satisfying. A habit needs to be enjoyable for it to last. Every habit that we have is something that satisfies us on some level, whether we think it does or not. Um, there, he talks a lot in the book about a mismatch between instant gratification and delayed rewards. Usually bad habits are things that gratify, gratify us instantly, um, right? Biting my nails somehow must have made me calm down. Um, so that was a bad habit. Um, a delayed reward, like going to exercise, you are not gonna go work out and have a different body when you come home, right? That's gonna take 
weeks and months and years of consistency to see a, a tangible change. Um, and there's a mismatch. These things that are good for us likely are things that we won't reap the rewards of for a long time to come, saving money. Um, and our brains don't like that, right? So how can we make some things that is good for us in the long run be satisfying now? There's a lot of little tricks and sometimes we do these things with our kids, right? When we're trying to teach them a new behavior, we have a sticker chart and as stupid as it sounds, our brains have this part in us that that's rewarding for us as adults too. And I'm not saying you need a sticker chart, but perhaps you even need um, just a calendar where you get to check it off. I think the Jerry Seinfeld example was he would write, I don't even remember what it was, a joke a day or write for 30 minutes a day. And he would make an X on his calendar every time he did it. And he did not want to see that calendar have any missed Xs. And that was enough of a satisfaction for him to continue to write. Um, these, these habit tracking things are great tools. It might seem silly, but they really do work. Another thing that I've done with clients is have them get a, like a pretty jar, like a clear jar with some pretty marbles in it. And every time, or some pretty marbles on the side, and every time they do their desired behavior, they get to put a marble in there. And it's satisfying to see your jar of marbles grow. <laughs> We're not that different from the kids with the sticker charts. We're really not. Um, so make it satisfying. That's just one idea. There's probably other ways you can make it satisfying, um, like getting an accountability partner. So if you want to work out and your accountability partner is waiting for you outside at 6 a.m. to go for a walk, um, you're not going to miss. That's the satisfaction of seeing your friend. Um, whereas if you were in your bed trying to get up by yourself and it was cold and dark and you probably just stay in your bed, right? We need the satisfaction of seeing our friend and not letting them down. That's what coaches are really good too. They're a built-in accountability partner. Um, obviously to break a bad habit, inverse it like we did all the other ones, make it unsatisfying. Um, how can we make something we like to do unsatisfying? I mean, that's the idea behind those like, those nail polishes that taste bad or whatever, right? Like. It's not, it, you don't want to put that in your mouth or, um, um, you know, maybe again with the accountability partner, if you're trying to work on say meditation and you have somebody who is going to check in with you and say, Hey, did you get to meditate this week? And you were like, right. That's unsatisfying feeling to have, you feel like you would let somebody down. So what did we talk about today? A lot, huh? The five habits, um, I mean, I, the five factors of health plus the four laws of habit change, right? So we, we had the, um, let's see my, my, uh, my title on this slide is incorrect. That's supposed to say five factors. That's, so anyway, the five factors of health are eating, sleeping, training, thinking, and connecting. Um, you can think of these on a scale of one to 10. Where would you rank yourself in terms of where you want to be? What would, what would be ideal for you? What would lead you to be that person who you want to be when you're 100 years old in terms of eating, sleeping, training, thinking, and connecting? And where are you now? Um, see where maybe you are most efficient and where you can be 1% better. Think of a very specific action, actionable item, right? So you'd have your goal. Your goal might be I want to eat better, but then have your very specific action. I want to eat a vegetable at every meal. Um, and then take these laws and try to apply them to, that, to, to those habits, right? Make the vegetables obvious, buy them, cut them, prepare them, make it attractive, make it easy and make it satisfying. Um, I'm going to end you on this word. It's called Kaizen and it's, it's a Japanese word. It just means continual improvement. I hope that, that the spirit of this presentation is reflective in that you should never feel down about 
any place that you currently are, right? Where you are is where you're supposed to be. Um, we get the opportunity to try to be better every day. If there's things that we feel like we want to be better at and that's why we are still living and breathing here on this earth. Um, you're just right right now, but how can you be better tomorrow, right? None of us would wanna look at ourselves next year and say we're still in some certain ruts that we're in now. Um, you can change anything you want. It just starts with tiny little things, 1% better every day, and you get to keep getting better every day. Thank you guys. Um, again, my name is Alicia Cardi. You can find me, um, you can contact me. Here's my email address, alicia at fitburrow.com and my website is fitburrow.com. Hope you have a fabulous 2021 and that you keep getting better.